So I, uh, I'm going to do my PowerPoint presentation. I like doing it in this format. I know I can go in and I can do like a, uh, a um, full screen view, but I like having the slides that I can see. So I know what I'm, what's coming up. So uh, periodically I may zoom in so you could get a better look at uh, various slides. But uh, today I want to talk about the uh, solar, uh, my solar eclipse analysis. I had two things I did during the eclipse. One is my QRRS beacon. And the second was a solar tracker that I built to track the path of the sun throughout the eclipse and log various data. Tonight, I just want to talk about the beacon part of it. Uh, and as uh, Eric said, more to do with the propagation piece. So the agenda is going to talk a little bit about the beacon architecture. I've already talked about this. So I'm just going to show you basically the configuration, what I did, how I set it up, my antenna, all that stuff. And then I want to focus more so on the data collection and the results, because I got some pretty surprising results. And as always, take what I say with a grain of salt. I'm no expert, especially when I start talking about the ionosphere and you know reflection and refraction all that stuff you know take that with a grain of salt i'm no expert it's just uh what i kind of un understand so uh, as usual my references this is the first presentation where i am referring to myself so all these presentations are presentations i did myself there's one i did where i talk about the software i used as part of the beacon i used a something called a lock-in amplifier to detect the beacon. And uh, I talked about the beacon design during my uh, Miller Effect uh, third presentation where I talk about ne negative feedback. I talk about uh, uh, the beacon that I built and uh, talk about MOSFETs because I do use MOSFETs. I talk about how MOSFETs work. And uh, also, too, I talk about 4NEC in my long wire analysis. And uh, I'll... I'll talk, I'm not going to show any um, uh, for an neck analysis, but uh, you could see this is a real good lead into a for an neck analysis. Now, this came about from HamSci. For those of you who don't know what HamSci is, it's a collaboration of amateur radio uh, uh, folks as well as uh, university professors. And they are doing research, ionospheric research, using amateur radio propagation, you know, um, uh, measurements. And uh, last year, I think it was the first ever paper that was published, an official paper published by the professors, by the University of Scranton. And uh, there's a, a couple of the universities list, listed there. The very first paper that got published where it analyzes the ionosphere using ham radio propagation. So that was really exciting for, uh, for them. So they are, are really big into amateur radio propagation. And so what they did as part of the eclipse was they set up a whole bunch of experiments where they would measure propagation during the, the eclipse. So I looked at this and I thought, hey, this is a real good opportunity for me to do some experimentation. And before I, I kind of get into this, I just kind of wanted to give you a timeline here. And this will explain a lot of <laughs> why things happened or why things didn't happen. So I started work in the Beacon back um, in December 2023, which is approximately four months before the eclipse. Not really four months. I actually worked on it three months because I started to work on the solar tracker a month before the eclipse. And so for three months, I had to do all my LT spice simulations, do PCB prototyping milling, send away to get my JLC PCB boards done. I had to write all the software. Uh, I used a real-time clock, a SI5351. I had to write the code to generate Morse uh, CW, uh, generate Whisper, and uh, generate this mode called QRRS. Then I had to write my... Uh, a program in Python to configure the beacon, beacon and then the decoder to decode this QRRS. Shouldn't be, shouldn't be QRSS. Uh, okay, and 
So with that in mind, that leads to the next slide here is, what do you think will happen when you try and do too much in too little time? Well, Murphy comes into play. Murphy rears his uh, ugly head and you end up putting uh, the wagon in front of the horse and uh, things go wrong. So during this talk, I'll be, I've got my Murphy log and I'll talk about the good, the bad and the ugly. And uh, I put it, I soften, I say improvements, but that's basically my Murphy log. What, it, what didn't work, what messed up and then what did work. So let's get into the beacon now. So this slide was from my prior presentation that I talked about uh, the eclipse and I updated it. Uh, the last uh, time I talked, I wasn't sure how long we were gonna be in uh, 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 the total eclipse. It turned out we had two minutes and 30 seconds, two minutes, 34 seconds, I believe. But uh, we had two and a half minutes um, uh, of uh, darkness, which was really cool. And so I talked about reverse beacon, how I wasn't going to use reverse beacon. I ended up using reverse beacon and reverse beacon gave me some really, really good information. And one of my concerns was with re reverse beacon is the time it takes the beacon to register you. So if you send a, uh, a CQ or you, in this case, I send a test message, test the EVA3 TJR, you know, blah, blah, blah. It could take several minutes before it registers you. And in over that several minutes, you, the eclipse has passed. You missed it. So what I ended up doing was using two call signs and transmitting on alternating frequencies. And I was able to shorten that down to like, you know, like uh, 20, 30 second intervals, which was good. And I got some really good data. So on top of that, I decided to build my own propagation, my own uh, propagation mode, which I call QRRS. There's no such thing. And so what I did was I would send my QRRS message and then I'd send a R uh, RBN, uh, CW message three times. Then I would rinse, rinse and repeat. And I used a web SDR, actually Kiwi S SDR, to receive the sig signals and then process it. And as I said, there is no such thing called QRRS. I made it up. And basically what it is, it's a, um, it's a, I, I would send a CW call sign because I need, need to be legal. I would identify myself. Well, I, I identified Peter. I used Peter's uh, call sign. I got permission from him. So I would send a call sign and then I would, I would send a constant carrier for five seconds. And my decoder would try and detect that five second carrier using something called a lock-in amplifier. And so using that staggered call with, with the VPN, here's actually on the day, uh, on, on Eclipse Day, you could see the two call signs I use. One is VA3 TGR, which is my son's call sign, and my call sign v, VE3 OI. And so what I would do is I would first send out three calls test the EV3 OI, blah, 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 send that out three times. Then the next time I would send, uh, use the second call sign and it would shift the frequency by about a thousand Hertz. And then I'd send three calls. Then I would rinse and repeat this. I kept doing it for five diff different frequencies. And I did that for two and a half hours throughout the entire uh, eclipse. And so here's the architecture uh, that I use. Here's my beacon. Uh, uh, it's got a nano, SI5351, real-time clock, low-pass filter. And uh, this is connected to a 20-meter NFED antenna I had here mounted to a rail and coax running inside the house. And you can see, I think, let me zoom in. I think you could see the antenna wire here going up to the tree. You could see the antenna, the gray antenna wire there going up to the tree. So that would transmit. And then I went to a web SDR and I would uh, um, get the sound, feed it into my signal detector program and decode uh, the peaks. And you can see the peaks here where it uh, saw the beacon. And so my setup, I, I, I just showed you the antenna, but here you can see here 
the um, MFJ analyzer, and I, I think you could see that it's got a one-to-one, -one, the SWR using the antenna in this configuration. I was getting a one-to-one -one match, which is perfect. Uh, no tuner necessary, uh, but I did have a very short counterpoise attached. The red terminal is the antenna and the black terminal is the counterpoise. And so I had a very short uh, 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 counterpoise. And the beacon was inside this plastic tin inside the house. And I had my power supply plugged into the wall, feeding it, and then the antenna connected uh, to it. And uh, just kind of just to show you the location we were at during the eclipse, we did have some low cloud, some very wispy thin clouds. Majority of the day we had a blue sky but we did have some wisps. And here you could see, this is actually the eclipse. This is a picture I took with my phone and my phone didn't have enough resolution where you could see the annular ring, but uh, you could see the eclipse there and you could see the, the wisps of cloud, but we still had a pretty, pretty good view. And this is the horizon during uh, the eclipse. And this here is a really interesting video because during the eclipse, as just before, you get uh, you know the uh, a total block of the sun. Animals started going crazy. So I hope you could hear this, but you could hear the birds here. And you could see the birds. They were just flying around. They were just going crazy. It was as if it's nighttime, and they thought it was nighttime to go to a tree, their favorite tree, to roost. And that was kind of interesting seeing that. So, and then, um, so everything looked great, you know, and I'm going to play this video as, uh, as I'm talking here. So this is the Kiwi SDR here. And this yellow part here, that's the actual passband. So you can see my beacon being transmitted, being received here. This is a, a SDR in Utah. One of the uh, SDRs in Utah. There's the, the configuration. So you can see it's picking up my beacon and you'll hear in a second, you'll hear right there, you could hear the carrier. And then you, and there's the, the RBN call. So everything looked great. I, I was uh, decoding the data and I thought everything's good. My solar tracker was set up and working. My wife's happy. She's having a glass of wine, enjoying the eclipse. All appeared good in the world, but not so. So I'm just going to stop that. So not the case. So what ended up happening after I got home and I got my data and I looked at my data that my QRR, QRRS decoder had saved, it was gibberish. Okay, and so what happens is that, and I knew this and I thought it wouldn't be a problem, but it turned out to be a problem. It's just the way Python works. Python is not very good at multi-processing. It does support threading, but it does it in a very uh, strange way, especially if you're running a GUI. And so the GUI has to be running in the background and then it, it generates these things called events. But, but anyway, what ended up happening, I had a thread running that's collecting the data from the sound card. Then I had another thread. Well, not a thread. The main thread is the, the actual GUI. And this matplotlib library in Python, that's what I used to, to generate the plot. That's running in the main code, OK? And that code has to be running. And if it's not running, it blocks everything. So what ends up happening is that it dropped all kinds of data. And it was a good thing because one of the things I did was I thought I backed up the data. Uh, I, well, the backup was to record the audio from Kiwi SDR. And I thought, anyway, you'll see. <laughs> That's another story. So, uh, so that was my backup. It was a good thing I did that because if I didn't do that, I'd have no data. So, and if you look at the, the data, you'll see what I mean. So here's the contents of that CSV file. So this is the file 
that the QRRS decoder Python program spits out and it puts the data in this file. So this data is like, I don't know, 15 minutes long. So you can see here, you start seeing nice peaks. It's uh, detecting it. You could see them all spacing, but you notice the peaks are getting less and less well-defined until finally you're getting like one point. And that's because I'm missing data. It was, uh, it was dropping data and this was only over the, a, a period of, of 10 minutes. So my Murphy's log, first thing is you got to test your algorithms and you got to make sure you test it over duration of operation because this thing was supposed to run over two and a half hours. I had only run it for a couple of minutes and it seemed to be working over a couple of minutes. If I had to run it over two hours, I would have caught this problem. So I didn't catch this until it was too late. So that's that was my first dumb mistake. Next dumb mistake. Now, Kiwi SDR, it's a hardware platform, and you could go and buy it. I think it's a couple hundred bucks. Anyone could go buy it. You buy it, it connects to a Beagle Bone, and it's got uh, your antenna connection. It's got a GPS antenna connection, and then it's got external clock. And so this hardware has a timeout of 30 minutes. So if you connect to, to the Kiwi SDR, it times out after 30 minutes, you're dropped, okay? And then it's got a maximum duration of 90 minutes. If you connect 30 minutes and then you reconnect for another 30 minutes and you connect for another 30 minutes, it kicks you out permanently after 90 minutes, okay? So that was a, a problem I had to solve. I knew about it and I thought I'd solved it, but I didn't really, but it worked out okay. I ended up working out okay. The next thing is it's got this record button here, this little uh, circle here. So you click that button and it records the sound. And I assume that, you know, once you close the browser, it saves the sound. No, it doesn't. You have to go back and manually click the button. So you click it once to start and you click it a second time to stop and save your, your recording. So what ended up happening, the first uh, half hour or so, I did not get any data. So, you know, the second uh, log here is you got to look at that web SDR timeout issue. And so one of the things I, 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 and I knew about this going into it, Sunday I reached out to the provider at Utah and I sent them an email saying, hey, listen, can you guys uh, do an exception here so that I could uh, do this over two and a half hours? Well, they didn't get back to me until Monday night after the eclipse. So I wasn't able to do it. So I had to record for like 20 minutes, stop, then start another record for, for 20 minutes and kept doing that, right? But I ended up getting the data. So let's look at the let's start looking at the data now so let me look at first the rbn data because i think this is the most interesting part because this explains a lot as well by looking at this so first of all let's talk about let's get the vernacular right so we're all talking about you all understand things are going to be saying because they're going to be so talking about c1 c2 c3 c4 so c1 is the first contact during the eclipse okay C1 contact, one first contact, which in Leamington, that happened at 1.58 and 47 seconds. So 1.58 p.m. was uh, C1, and that's when the moon just touches the sun. It just kisses the sun. That's the first contact. Then you go through a partial eclipse, okay? Then at C2 is when the moon kisses the opposite side of the sun, and at that point, you've got a total eclipse. You've got the full eclipse. And that started in Leamington about 3.13 p.m. And the time when the, the moon moves off the sun, it just moves off of the, the, the sun. That's contact 3, C3, which is 3.16. So I had 2 minutes and 34 seconds of total eclipse, right? And then it continues to move. You, you, you get the partial eclipse. And it moves and right till the end where it just steps off of the sun. That's called C4, the fourth contact. And that happened at 428 p.m. Okay, so here's the RBN data. 
I can end my talk now. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Here's the data. So what I did was I just plotted. This is the big picture. I'm going to zoom in and talk about things. So here's all the RBN data. So this is this number here at the top is the uh, DB. Um, uh, that it's, it's got so I I think it's a dB above the noise floor how strong your signal is so each line here represents a uh, RBN uh, spotter so here it is for Kansas City for South Carolina the purple is South Carolina the orange red is uh, Calgary the green is for uh, New Hampshire the what's that uh, like a blue that's for Massachusetts. The green is for Utah. I had two sites in Utah. The black is uh, U Utah as well. So you can kind of see it's it's um, there's there's no no obvious trends here. There's a lot of dips. The, a couple of observation. You know, during the so C1 here is the time at which C1 happens, right there about 158. I think it was. That was C1. Then C2 is like 316 or 314, something like that. Then 318 is uh, C3. So here's uh, here's the period of the total eclipse. And then C4, I didn't record the data for C4 at about, at, at about this time here. At about this, this time here, uh, the wife was uh, getting anxious and I had to pack up and leave. So no obvious trends here. During the total eclipse, there is some dips you're seeing here. There's a dip in the purple. There's a dip in the green. But that doesn't mean anything. There are lots of dips in the green. Uh, one kind of observation here is that you see a lot of, you know, peaks and valleys during uh, C1 to C2, during the partial eclipse. And then it looks as if, you know, it kind of smooths out here towards the latter part of the after uh, uh, the uh, total eclipse. So I don't know if that's that's relevant. I, I can't say for sure that's that's uh, that's relevant. But let's kind of zoom in here a little bit. So this now, this are the stations I heard before the eclipse, before the total eclipse, during the total eclipse, and after the total eclipse. So if you look here, you'll see I got three. Stations, one's in uh, South Carolina, in Utah, two in Utah, and one in South Carolina. They were heard throughout the entire uh, eclipse. Now, what I did here, you could see the dotted lines. It's what that is, that's a least squared fit. So I'm, it's a least squared is just finding the minimum deviation between the points. So think of it as kind of the average. So if you look at what the average is of, for the the Utah, the West Jordan, you could see it starts off higher and it looks as if it's, if it's decreasing. You could see a decreasing trend. Same thing for the green, the, uh, the second Utah station in Washington, uh, Utah. It starts high and you could see it decreasing. It comes down lower here. So there seems to be a decreasing trend for the Utah stations. However, the Myrtle Beach, uh, the, uh, the Myrtle Beach uh, South Carolina, spotter it's increasing now i don't know if that's relevant i i we can't make any judgment on that but that's kind of you know from from the data you know it it doesn't look as if it's consistent across the the eclipse here what was way more interesting was this was this chart this is this is the the money shot Okay, so the orange is the Alberta station, okay, and the green is the uh, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. It cuts out. So during C1, C2, that's when, you know, your the sun is getting more and more covered. It cuts out. It's, it disappears, and you don't hear it back again. It's gone. And if you look at the uh, Calgary station, you know, it transmits here. That's the last time we hear from it until almost right at the end. So it cuts out. It appears to cut out as well. Now, I can't say for sure it, it cut out because was the reverse beacon station just busy and it never picked me up? I don't know. But it looks as if it uh, it didn't pick, pick me up. So from this, we could see that 
to the southwest. So the Utah propagation, it wasn't impacted by the eclipse because we saw the Utah stations right through the entire uh, eclipse. Same thing with the um, South Carolina. We saw it throughout the entire eclipse. So it looks as if southwest and southeast, we did we didn't, it wasn't impacted by the uh, eclipse. However, if you look at east, because um, uh, New Hampshire and uh, Massachusetts is more east of me, the more easterly um, spotters cut out. So that was kind of interesting to note there. So, and this, this now brings it home. So if we take a look at the the eclipse, the path of the eclipse, right here, this X is where I was, that's me, and I put an X is where all the spotters saw me, right, and here's the path of the total eclipse, so that's where total darkness was, and just outside here is the partial eclipse, so, uh, you know, maybe for 100 kilometers, I don't know, 50 kilometers, you would see a partial eclipse, you would see the full eclipse, uh, the uh, you'd see the sun partially covered. So the ionosphere could be affected by just a small amount. You look at the path of the total eclipse and this yellow line's kind of halfway. So if, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, reflection scattering and all that stuff in a second, but you could see it's feasible that I'm bouncing off of the ionosphere that's inside the area of uh, total eclipse. So that's that may explain why these two sites cut off during the eclipse, because the, the ionosphere cooled off and uh, I was no longer getting. Now keep in mind, this is all in 20 meters, okay? I should have said that right up front. This is all 20 meters, 14.1 megahertz. So now if you look at to the west, the other uh, stations that heard me during uh, before, during, and after the total eclipse. Here, uh, Alberta, Utah, and South Carolina. Well, you could see that, you know, when I'm bouncing off of the ionosphere, I am well outside of the uh, total eclipse. So the ionosphere is nice and hot, it's working, and so that's why these stations never cut out during the eclipse. And you'll see that shortly when I show my QRRS uh, data. But Calgary, again, I don't know why it cut out. I don't know if that's an RBN thing. It just maybe the RBN spotter there was busy, didn't hear me. Uh, but it was very strange that uh, it didn't hear me for a while, then it picked me up towards the end of the eclipse. And I'm talking about this slide here. The, the orange is the, the Alberta, it picked me up here right before the uh, C2. And then I wasn't heard until almost C4. So I'd assumed that was because the ionosphere had cooled off during here. But uh, I don't think so. Because if I look at this, you know, I am uh, skipping off of the ionosphere well outside the um, uh, total eclipse. So my Murphy's log, well, I, I think my first success here is RBN worked really well. Got some really good data from uh, RBN. But what I needed, what I need to do is plan my orientation a little bit better because you'll see that the Utah stations here, which is where I had my uh, SDR uh, recording QRRS, is outside, and uh, you know it it heard me all during the eclipse, and you couldn't determine anything. So I think I have to plan if I was ever to do this again. I have to plan it a little better and get multiple SDR sites similar to what uh, RBN, get some close, far away, so I can really get a feel of what's going on. Okay, so what can be inferred from the RBN uh, data? So if you take a look at this, you know, I, I, and I'm kind of getting into area which I used to understand this stuff. I studied this stuff like 40 years ago. So, you know, 35, 40 years ago. So there's there's a couple of ways that you can propagate waves. There's reflection, refraction, diffraction, or scattering. And so I, 
uh, I'm going to assume that this is, is a kind of reflection where the incident wave is bouncing off of the, the ionosphere where incident angle and reflection angle are equal. So, you know, if this is four miles or 400 miles here, right here, it'll be halfway, it'll be 200 miles. So I'm gonna assume that, and my beacon is gonna transmit, hits the ionosphere, bounce back, and picked up from an antenna. Furthermore, I'm gonna, you know, according to this, I don't know what it was, what the height of the, the F layer was for that day, but it says here it's anywhere between 150, 500 kilometers. So if I assume the height of the ionosphere at this point above the Earth's surface is 400 kilometers, just as an assumption, so two, two assumptions, one, incident angle and reflection angle are the same. Second assumption, it's we've got 400 uh, kilometers, the height of the ionosphere, whatever the F2 layer or whatever's involved, but uh, um, uh, 400 kilometers. What can we infer from this RVN data? Well, if you look at where I was, and I've got Alberta, which was 2704 kilometers, 2,700 kilometers, Utah, 26, 28, about, roughly about 2,700 kilometers, you know, and uh, Massachusetts, 7,600, you know, roughly about six or 700 kilometers, South Carolina, 1,100 kilometers. So if I do a little bit of trig, assume the height here is 400, and this distance here is half of the total distance here, can I determine what my takeoff angle is for my NFED antenna? So for 2704 for uh, Alberta, that works out to be 16 degrees. For Utah, turns out to be about 35 degrees. And for uh, um, Massachusetts, uh, North Carolina, turns out to be 48 degrees. Sorry, 1130 is the uh, South Carolina. So 16 degrees is Alberta, 35 degrees is Utah, and uh, 48, oh no, uh, 35 degrees is South Carolina, and uh, 48 degrees is uh, Massachusetts. I didn't do Utah here. So does this mean that my lobes coming off of my NFED antenna were at 16, 35, and 48 degrees? So it'd be interesting to go back, model, my antenna in four neck and see what the takeoff angles are and see if this holds water. I'm not, I'm not prepared to do that, but it's just interesting that how, what you could glean from data like, like that. So let me just turn over to my QR, again, I made a mistake here, QRRS data. You save that. So let's take a look at my QR, RS data and see what that says. So as I said, uh, my recording, I lost some of my data from when I recorded it because the um, uh, uh, decoder program wasn't saving the data properly. So uh, it was a good thing I went on the SDR website and I recorded the audio. However, I didn't start recording the audio until about 2.42 PM. So I missed C1. So C1 is kind of off of the page here. So this bottom chart is a continuation of this chart here. So this starts at, this ends at 304 and this starts at 305. Now each of these lines here, that is the, my program detecting my QRRS uh, uh, decoder program, uh, detecting that signal that was in a offline uh, audio file. So I replayed the audio file and I decoded the data and I got this. Now, if you look, the blue is the data from the lock-in. So it's saying the lock-in algorithm de detected the beacon and the orange is from the FFT. And you can see they're both, you know, they're pretty close. And if you draw the average, I just kind of eyeballed it. That purple line is about the average. It's what's that, 12 million or so? Right, um, so it's it's around there, and so now here's the continuation, and here's C2, C3. So this here's the total eclipse. You can see it's still 
about the same. It hasn't changed. And remember, in the reverse beacon data, we saw Utah. There was no, there was nothing. There was a little bit of a downward um, um, uh, uh, degrade of 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 uh, the signal, but you could see it's pretty constant here. It's still about that 12 million mark. Now, if we go, so after C2 now after C3. So this here is a continuation from here. Here's 329, here's 349, little bit of a gap there. But now, if you look at after between C3 and C4, C4 didn't capture, C4 is off of the page here, you'll see that it's dropped down a little bit, which is consistent with the RBN data. And it's showing that, you know, the a magnitude I'm seeing from the FFT and the lock-in, it has dropped a little bit. So RBN did show that it was decreasing a little bit, and so did my uh, QRSS uh, data. Now, why that's happening, I don't know. I don't think it's part of the uh, the eclipse. Frankly, I don't think it's part of the eclipse. I think it's maybe just uh, you know uh, daytime cooling. I, I don't know. It just it's just slowly uh, degrading as time goes along. I, I don't know. I can't make any uh, uh, observation from that. So my QRS mode worked really well, provided I had the data and my detection uh, software was working properly. So that worked out very well. So at that point, I'll finish off and I'll, I'll stop my presentation here.